I think that without any further delay, I will uh, start giving uh, the floor to Albert. Thank you, Laura. So, hi everyone, Albert Whale. I, I'm the founder and CEO of IT Security Solutions in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Some call it the cyber capital of the world, cybersecurity capital of the world. Recently, I launched a book. It's publishing today, as a matter of fact, on Amazon. Um, it's available at thehackedbook.com. And we talk about different things that happen in cybersecurity itself. And this is the pre-launch site. So it doesn't have quite the information that the actual physical launch site has. But in today's um, talk, we're scheduled to talk about quantum computing. Quantum computing, is it real? Well, in my mind, it is real, okay? But the complexity of everything is trying to understand a qubit as, as a different model for data storage and really thinking outside the box um, with differences for quantum computing versus the classical computing environment. The problem comes that we, we're not just doing a binary storage of data. We actually have the ability to have both zero and one in the qubit value, as well as every single value in between in an infinite scale. And that's what we'll be talking about today for quantum computing. It's breaking all the rules in classical computing so that we can advance in a quantum mechanics world to rationalize what's going on next, but also breaking all the rules in classical as well as the encryption. So I hope you enjoy the presentation today. My name again is Albert Whale. If you need to reach me, my uh, email address is right there on the screen, and I'm sure you'll be able to pick it up in the recording session later on. I'm sorry, Laura. Sorry, you're... sorry. Yeah, right. <laughs> I was just trying to introduce you, Chris. Chris, thank you very much for being with us. Uh, I know that you are working on amazing things with Orca. Please uh, uh, tell us uh, a little bit more. And uh, most importantly, let us understand uh, your view about uh, the technology. Thank you. Thank you very much, Laura. Um... Yeah, my name is Chris Kaczmarek. I'm head of product for Orca Computing. So we are a London-based uh, quantum computing startup, officially spun out of uh, Oxford University. Um, just in terms of my background, so I did a PhD in quantum physics at Oxford with the academic co-founders of Orca. I developed some of Orca's core uh, quantum memory technology. I'll explain what that is in a moment. After which I done a bit of uh, academic stints here and there before um, you know help coming to Orca joining full time and now as head of product I, I still have a toe in uh, developing the technology and then on the R&D side of things but uh, increasingly um, I'm spending more and more time thinking about how do you translate that cool technology we're developing into actual customer solutions something quite unique about our company is that from an early start it was founded by both you know, world-class academics and uh, business leaders. And so it's in our DNA to not only do cool science, but actually translate that science into useful solutions for customers now. So uh, in terms of what we do at Orca, in terms of our technology, so we are taking the photonics approach to quantum computing. So our qubit, and I must say, Albert, I, you have to send me that uh, picture from Family Guy, that's amazing. Well, I'm glad but, you like that. I'll, I'll be happy to. No, it was fantastic. I think it really well, uh, you know, describes what we're talking about here. These quantum objects that can exist, you know, in different states at once, uh, expanding the capabilities of, you know, information processing. Um, so in Orca, you, you know, we take the qubit and we, we encode that qubit into a photon, into a single particle flight. And then we manipulate these photons to perform computations. So, you know, there's uh, a lot of companies right now in the quantum computing space. It is an exploding field, a lot of private and public uh, investment being poured into it. 
both you know with huge players like Google and IBM doing interesting stuff, but also a lot of cool startups like ours coming up with unique solutions. So specifically on the photonic side of things, you know, the nice thing about photons is that light doesn't really interact with anything. You can, you know, send light over very long distances. It's used for modern telecommunications. And, uh, you know, you send, you know, our internet, we're speaking through uh, signals carried on underwater, under ocean uh, optical fibers. So the nice thing about photonics approaches, and especially the way we do it as Zorka, is that we can leverage all that existing mature telecoms technology to build quantum computers. You know, we have to sprinkle a bit of quantum into that, and we have some unique, uh, unique um, solutions that allow us to do that, uh, including these quantum memories. So these are devices that allow us to capture and release these photons, these single particles of light, allowing us to, you know, synchronize and buffer, basically act as a kind of operational memory like RAM in a classical computer for a quantum computer. And that actually is a unique thing about Orca and something that allows us to, you know, build really practical and scalable uh, quantum computing systems using light. Can you make an example? Of, uh, of for of example? A, of a product that you are building? Just yeah, to give, so... to, be, to let people visualize in what what is the outcome finally? What What is the product? Because you, you started uh, saying, uh, we want to make it a product and give something to people. Let me understand what are you going to give us? Absolutely. So the first system will be, we will be releasing uh, later this year. Actually, we are, you know, we are, we are offering it to select customers, but we'll be officially launching uh, later this year is uh, room temperature kind of rack size. So if you imagine a standard telecoms rack, so that kind of footprint. Um, quantum pro photonic, so photon based quantum processor. Now it's not a universal quantum computer. It, uh, it performs what's called boson sampling, which is a particular flavor of quantum computing, very good for photonics. But this quantum processor can solve certain problems that an equivalent classical processor would be, you know, would struggle with. And so maybe it doesn't, you know, do your whole computation, but can, we can solve, you know, a particular part that is very difficult to solve. So at Orca, what, you know, what we're seeing, and a lot of companies are starting to catch up, catch up to the idea that you know, it will take some time before we have you know, universally useful, quant fully quantum systems. And the way to go for near-term quantum advantage is hybrid systems, where you have a quantum and a classical system efficiently talking with each other. And again, our approach of using telecoms technology is very nice here because telecoms already talks very efficiently to uh, classical processing systems. But yeah, and our first product will be kind of rack, uh, kind of 19 inch rack sized uh, device operating at room temperature and ambient conditions. So no, you know, no need for temperatures close to the to outer space no need for special cooling or vacuums all built that's using amazing what, what's the cost technology. of that going to be so can i buy one for my office yeah uh you know we'd have to discuss uh pricing uh, in <laughs> personally but like let me say it, it will be orders of magnet it's orders of magnitude cheaper than uh you know some of the competing systems that's fantastic so it's, it's something that we will touch very soon, yes. much sooner than what, what is normally expected. Because when we talk about quantum computing, we generally think, okay, it's going to come in 10 years, 15 years. It, it seems that some little brick of the wall could be available. Well, I think it's already here. I mean, okay. as Chris is already saying, they're working on improving a product from the deep um, cold space temperatures to something more room temperature like by uh, shifting over to a Bosian sampling for photons in light and making that shift already indicates that quantum computing is here. We're just refining it to make it more habitable for us to use as humans, right? That is absolutely correct. And, you know, this is in the theme of what we're talking about is now we're at the stage where we really have to learn how to operate these machines. I mean, we, you know, quantum physicists know how to operate it, but right. getting people to really know how to program these new type of devices, that's, you know, that's key. 
that's kind of what I was uh, keying on in our prelude to the, the meeting. I mean, they don't program the same way as classical computers do. And this is going to be a whole new industry that's coming up, you know, working with quantum computing. But let me understand, do we have the machines for doing that? For, 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 for the large public, let's say? Well, not for the large public, for the large right. corporations. Okay. There, are, there are governments that have um, invested in quantum computing. There are large organizations such as Google that have quantum computing and in different, different types, different roles, different um, acumen to support whatever they're researching. But, you know, they've solved problems that classical computers might take 600 million years to do. Right, but- And they do it in very short order. So right. they exist today. So can you clarify, uh, I don't know who are you, what is, uh, what we can really do now and what we can't do now, but is going to come? Because again, I, I think people need uh, to really understand how close is uh, the technology. Personally, um, listening uh, to, um, to what is uh, said around the, the quantum computing is perceived uh, as a kind of um, um, element that will put at risk uh, all uh, algorithm um, uh, for our private keys. So I'm, I'm wondering, uh, uh, why do I perceive a quantum computing as a risk uh, while it seems that you are um, teaching it uh, as a uh, uh, an enabler. That's a, a, a lot of a lot to unpack in that question. <laughs> yeah, there there's <laughs> like seventeen questions there. Um, do you want to take a crack first, or do you want me to take a stab at it, Chris? Yeah, go go ahead. Happy okay, then, so uh, initially, uh, quantum computing is going to break all encryption that it currently exists using classical computing today. All right, the idea that we have secrets enabled that are protected by encryption standards because our current um, Moore's law technology, meaning classical computers that created the encryption that applied it to the data so that it's protected will be broken and there will be no secrets using classical encryption standards. RSA is already broken. Um, there's another one, SSL is already broken. But, you know, there are some new standards like TLS and higher levels of encryption, which using classical computers take 10,000 years to decode or decrypt. Using a quantum computer, the data is already there. It's that quick. OK, so what does that mean? That means that people that can afford the class or the quantum computing will have access to all of the information unprotected, un um, disguised, un undisclosed by any means of any encryption. They'll be able to break it real time. So we'll need to work on new encryption standards that are quantum based. It'll be quantum encryption. And that's going to take a while to implement because the people that have the resources that already are discovering the secrets that are currently encoded, encrypted, um, they don't want to give up that luxury, right? They don't want other people to have that advantage. And that's going to put <clears throat> companies like Chris's company, Orca, to work faster because people are going to have a higher demand to have more resources to encode the data using quantum computing. Is that a good segue for you, Chris? Yeah, absolutely. So I think, you know, in terms of co computers that can break encryption, like those, we don't have them yet. Those will come, you know, on a maybe 10 year time scale. But you're absolutely right that, that the data, yeah. the data that, you know, is already encrypted, like there is data we've already encrypted and we want to keep secure, which won't be secure in 10 years. So that's why we also have to think about, you know, new ways of encryption now to make not just the data will transfer in 10 years, but the data we have you know, ready, currently. we've already secured yeah. currently to, to, be, um, to be safe and you kind of, kind of future proof. 
Um, to the other point about, you know, in terms of access, these quantum computers, as Albert said, they are here. You know, you can access small toy systems through the cloud, through a, there's, you know, Amazon has its own service, IBM has its own service. So you can start playing with these machines already, um, not to mention all the kind of simulation tools we, we have in a lot of companies, including Arca have released to be able to, you know, on your personal laptop, start programming these devices to understand how they work. But, you know, these devices already, what these companies have, as Albert said, these big companies have, they are already more powerful than what, you know, consumers have access to, and they'll become more and more, more powerful. You can look at the roadmaps of these companies. You know, it's, people talk about a kind of super, uh, I don't remember, there is another, the Nevin law of quantum computing that goes faster even than the Moore's law. Oh, absolutely. And the researchers in China are light years ahead of most other organizations like Google I'm and sure. everybody else. <laughs> and, well, that's, and that's the I real problem, sure. right? I mean, <laughs> It's going to be a while before we can hold quantum computing in our hands. Although Orca sounds like they're going to make it much more possible because they've already put it into a room controlled environment in a rack mount. And if they put it in a rack mount, a 19 inch chassis system, I don't know how high, 72 high or whatever, then we can eventually reduce the scale and size of that hardware and eventually get it here. But let me understand, guys. It's not a, a, a I mean, a, 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 the, a one or the opposite of the other, um, quantum computing and the cloud. The cloud is notoriously unsecure. Agreed. Yeah, I mean, so, you know, there's two, two again, two maybe answers to this question. Indeed, like, you know, one thing is, you know, you have a quantum computer and you access it via cloud and you access it via, you know, classical encryption. And you hope that these uh, big companies, cloud providers have that secure connection. But the other thing is, you know, you'll, that encryption will have to become quantum. And again, where photonics uh, has a very nice role is that, you know, photons, the same photons that we use to process information, you can actually send across to transmit information. Um, you know, it's very easy to envision. instantaneously too. Yeah, it's very easy to envision uh, linking photonic quantum computers much easier than alternative platforms and actually creating a quantum internet. And there are these very, you know, clever schemes academics have thought out that once you have that capability, you can actually, you know, send your quantum encrypted data to a quantum computer, have it process it and get the result with no possibility of anyone eavesdropping on that. Even the, even the person controlling the quantum computer, even they don't know what the, what the data that has been processed was. Um, there are these clever schemes uh, called blind quantum computing. I've got a missing piece. Um, is that true or not that at the moment uh, and for a long time, there is not the ability to do all this simply because there is not the stability of uh, for, for transferring this, uh, this information in uh, real time. So we there's... do have the machines, but we don't have uh, the context that make the possible for those machines to work as you are describing. I, mean, I don't want to say that you are wrong. I just, I'm just trying to understand where we are really, because I love your enthusiasm, but I'd like really to position myself in the roadmap. <laughs> No, no, all these things, you know, in the lab, a lot of these things have been demonstrated, you know, like these toy systems have been built, photonics and other platforms. Now we're at the okay. question, now we're okay. at the level and that's where the companies come in. You know, it's very difficult to get a grant to say, okay, I'll make this thing slightly better. But from a company perspective, that slight improvement might be the thing that actually starts making money. So, you know, we are at the stage where all this technology is go, coming out of the lab and into the field, into industry. You know, people, the organizations buying these quantum computers uh, in terms of quantum security, you know, people, Swiss elections have been secured through, through quantum encryption. Uh, there have been these kind of large scale demonstrations and, you know, quantum communications, quantum key distribution is one of the most mature quantum technologies. Let me understand that. how big is a quantum computing computer? 
the device or the industry? No, no, the device, really the device. <laughs> well, it's yeah, getting so smaller. You, yeah, exactly. So, you know, traditionally you'd think of a quantum computer as, you know, a this- A large uh, refrigerator. A very large refrigerator. Yeah, yeah yes. that could mm. fill half a room if you also add like yeah. all the accompanying, you know, electronics and control systems. Mm. But, you know, our system is the size of a 19 inch track. So kind of uh, so it's wardrobe getting style. Okay. Yeah. So it's a definitely as, something as that the companies, okay, okay, companies could start considering as, a, as an option. So, Absolutely. I mean, the, they would be the are. early adopters. Yeah, yeah. They, they would be the early adopters. Can you tell me which are the industries that are already adopting in some way, in some form, uh, uh, quantum computing? Well, I think fintech and government agencies, the military, um, and, anyone that has to protect data. Just in cybersecurity alone, protecting data is the most essential element. And if your adversary already has quantum computing, then they're able to break the classical encryption technology that's being deployed now. So if you're ahead of the game and you implement quantum computing and quantum encryption, then you're going to be able to protect your data that much better. Do you agree, Chris, is that uh, at the moment quantum computing is used more as uh, an enabler of a higher level of security or an enabler of uh, or an emphasizer of uh, activities that today takes too much time or are totally yeah, so quantum impossible. Tech is like a, a lot of it is about privacy also on the kind of computing side of things yeah it's the same it's the industries albert said like financial industries also pharma uh chemistry all these companies also which require you know are already huge users of computational resources companies that have to do big scale simulations and calculations, they are really seriously looking into quantum computing um, because of the offer of much faster uh, calculations. And in terms so, of sustainability, because, sorry, Albert, go yeah, ahead. I was just going to add, it's not an exclusive one thing or the other. Yeah. The quantum computing absolutely speeds up processing of computational requirements that may never get done or completed with classical computing elements, but it can also be employed for the protection of data. So it's a dual purpose um, benefit. It's just the same as introducing the, the computer for you know, operations that we have today. We wouldn't be where we are in the internet if we were still in vacuum tubes um, and black and white TV, right? Let me understand it's the how, evolution. how difficult it is uh, to embrace uh, as a company for the purposes you have just described uh, quantum computing. Is that another set of skills? Uh, is that another division of the company? Um, how will be the implementation? Is that so difficult? Is that so easy? I guess there's like always two answers. Like in quantum, there's always multiple answers. You know, in some ways, uh, companies struggle even to get a new pen uh, type because, you know, big organizations are very, uh, are often very, you know, have a lot of uh, uh, difficulty implementing new solutions altogether, even if it's something that's been existing for 30 years, GPUs or, you know, FPGAs, certain computational things that have been existing for a long while are only being introduced now. So there is a certain uh, slowness. Adoption, to yeah. Yeah, adoption. Um, but also there's, you know, the, there's, the, there's a, a limited uh, workforce. People, you know, to, you know, we are doing a lot of work at Orca to build quantum computers and programming languages that can be used by people who don't necessarily have to understand quantum for machine learning scientists. But with many quantum providers, you really have to be almost a quantum scientist and maybe, you know, one of a thousand in the world to know how to program these things. Well, so well yeah, especially mean. early in the adoption phase, because, yeah. I mean, if we're working on quantum computing, we're working in quantum physics. And, you know, some of the quotes that I was looking up for preparation for this, were if you understand quantum physics, you really don't understand anything. Because it's both understanding and not understanding <laughs> that 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 makes it occur. And then then there's another quote that came up that said, 
um, the observer effect really can change the data all by itself. You can get a computation over here. If nobody's looking at it, it'll go and, and complete its job. But if you start looking at it, it changes the, the review of how it happens. So there's a lot of things that we have yet to learn and to mature the um, industry, but getting people involved in STEM is the first step because without science, technology, engineering, English and math or engineering and math, those skills are essential for programming and physical, um, the physicists and engineering roles that are gonna be in demand for quantum computing. Of course, of course. Uh, can you briefly explain the potential of quantum for AI? Yeah, that's probably one of the first uh, applications where we'll see, you know, a quantum advantage. Um, and the, machine learning. Exactly, exactly. And, you know, again, not to, uh, you know, pitch Orca too, too hard. This is not about just our company, but this is something, you know, we are working intensively in this idea of hybrid algorithms that, you know, there's a quantum part and a classical part that lends itself very well to machine learning and AI, um, where, you know, AI involves tackling, analyzing huge data sets. So any parallelism, any speed up that you can get that quantum could offer is, you know, will, will, will be essential. Um, we are limited with a lot of AI problems. We are at the limit of what classical computers can do. So quantum can definitely help there. Absolutely. So we will see uh, millions and billions of data scraped because of course, uh, with all this potential, fantastic potential to, uh, to be used uh, with uh, quantum computing, I guess uh, that we, the only problem will be finding the right data. Well, that's yeah, always maybe, you know, in how you view it, isn't it? <laughs> it will uh, somehow- It's a matter of perspective. <laughs> <laughs> it will really possibly instigate uh, some bad action there. Um, supremacy, any kind of, those who will uh, um, reach the supremacy first uh, will have some kind of supremacy. Absolutely. Yeah. Which could be a huge danger, right? It, there is that possibility. And, and that's why, you know, early adopters, like I said, um, initially, China is huge in it because they want to unravel all the secrets and all the encryption so that they have access to information faster than anyone else does. And Google and Microsoft and AWS, they're all trying to catch up to help protect their data and keep everyone safe. But I see a lot of that also potentially happening for our government as well. Hey. Guys, let's, let's try to be a little bit more uh, technical and explain what is the relationship between cloud and uh, quantum computing. So where is... Uh, um, what it's kind of like asking, what is the relationship between an apple and a banana? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. <laughs> because good. Uh, the cloud can exist without quantum computing, mm -hmm. but securing the data or making it transfer faster and... and with better protection is improved with quantum. So quantum doesn't make the cloud, but quantum computing can make the cloud better. Is that a good segue? It's like- Absolutely. BASF, we didn't make the memory tape, we make it better. Okay, that's one. And uh, tell me, um, if there is uh, something that you, you would uh, hope for the future of uh, quantum computing, what it is, what is the next step that you would like to see? Um, that, that you think is possible and achievable? I guess uh, on the technical side, you know, there are a few things we need to, some milestones we need to achieve, any platform. You know, we are seeing a race in a way. Um, it doesn't have to be a race. It doesn't have to be competitive. Maybe at some, maybe, you know, we'll reach a stage where different types of quantum computers are useful for the, used for different tasks. Mm -hmm. um, but the, all the platforms face certain challenges that need to be overcome. And I'm looking for, and these challenges, you know, it faced challenges since inception and we've been overcoming them. So I'm looking forward to seeing those challenges overcome, being overcome over the next few years. Um, and then just also on the commercial side adoption, like being more confident about 
using quantum computing, being more curious about seeing, you know, whether your particular business problem can quantum actually help with it uh, and being a bit more open to these new technologies that, that I'm looking forward to seeing as well. Albert? Yeah, I have to go along those lines. Um, I think that as the technology matures, it'll become more adoptable, more embraceable, but um, it, it can already be employed for, you know, DNA sequencing or virology, you know, vaccine processing, things of that nature, or the creation of cryptocurrency, because all that is a processing um, restriction that we can't overcome right now. Well, when I started to navigate the space of blockchain, I was told that never trust a technology because it will be replaced very soon. So um, we are now advocating for uh, a quantum computing that is particularly helpful for securing information. Fantastic. What comes next? Probably it will be at the time, uh, you know, the, the classical curve from uh, by Gardner, when it will start to get adoption, we will probably start to seeing something else. So that it will this, evolve further. Yes. Yeah. And, and what, so what can you dream? <laughs> yeah, what, what, because what? all of it is created by a dream, a picture in our mind. So basically, we cannot, we, we, we hope that it will make things better, but it will simply be another step towards something else. Towards something else. Okay, good. Yeah. I was waiting for, what are we stepping to? <laughs> That's the thing, right? It's like kind of asking a, a caveman, like, what's the next step after this rock? Like, can you imagine semiconductors? Can you imagine uh, lamps? <laughs> like... Some probably who... dreamed about this, but but we'll just have to see once we get there, step by step. I mean, what if we can difficult... transmit, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, if we can transmit data through vast distances in space and time through quantum computing, what's to stop us from transferring ourselves? Well, Einstein, uh, um, <laughs> yeah, and the, tell me one thing: what what is the missing piece from? Uh, what we are saying now to when we will eventually be used as some kind of uh, feature on our mobiles that benefits of quantum. What is missing to get there? Probably access. Somebody that owns the resources that you want to access. You could probably get that faster um, as a portal on your phone to the cloud computing environment rather than trying to own the cloud or the uh, quantum computer in your hand. That will take a little longer to digest and, and make available, but um, sounds like Orca is almost to a point where they can provide um, handheld access through an app. Yeah, as you know, everything... Yeah, and every, you know, all kind of computing technology, we're seeing a more and more movement towards the cloud, right? Like, you don't need a lot of computation in your phone if you can instantly connect with the huge computational resources somewhere. Um, That's, that will be the driver to the ability to, yeah, yeah. And um, uh, if this uh, is uh, the future, um, in what, in what way um, quantum computing can help or make it more difficult, the already ongoing uh, conversation around uh, self-sovereign identity and uh, any kind of other identity management? Well, wow. I don't know enough about security, but you know, the thing about quantum is you, <laughs> The, what, what Albert was saying recently, like there is the measurement problem. Once you see a quantum object, something you, you can encode quantum information, then you cannot copy it. There is a no cloning theorem in quantum. So you with quantum physics, you can create unique signatures that you can transfer, you can you know teleport, uh, but you cannot copy. So in that sense, if I understand your question correctly, quantum will allow us to really create, you know, 
identity signatures uh, protected by the laws of physics rather than any kind of computational uh, algorithm. And what will they be the limit? To... Sorry, go ahead, yeah, Alberto. They don't last to uh, withstand the test of time. They're short-lived, very short-lived. So if they are so short, I hope to live them more. So what's the solution? <laughs> uh, Things are getting better. We're I getting. I don't have you know, an answer for you. Yeah. These quantum memories, you know, there are. Uh, there've been experiments, like in a research context of you know being able to store quantum information for hours at a time at least, and uh, you know the limits are less fundamental, more kind of experimental. So I think we'll we'll reach a stage where we'll be able to secure quantum secure signatures. Um, at least to the extent that they're needed for a particular task. Right. And the, the, does it exist the portability of quantum? Something that travels with me, not that doesn't sit on a cloud? Eventually, yeah. It, that, will, that will take more than 10 years to reduce what he was talking about, a 19-inch wide storage rack Mm -hmm. uh, 72 inches high or, or five or six feet high. I don't know what they're working with at Orca, but in order to condense all of that um, hardware to secure the new software and put it into a handheld device. You remember the first cell phones that we had, they were an actual brick, right? And now we have a paper thin, well, not really, but a quarter inch thick, device that has a silicon and glass and and it's portable more portable than the old bricks were so it'll be an evolutionary phase to get there and you know right. if you're if you're not just talking about quantum computing if you're thinking broader about quantum tech you can already buy mobile phones that have chips that create you know real quantum real random numbers through quantum processes, these so-called quantum random number generators that are used to generate keys that, again, their randomness is guaranteed by the laws of physics. So these, you know, there are companies that produce these chips. There are companies that sell phones with these chips already. Um, so quantum tech is, is, is already here and you can have it in your phone. Not quantum computing yet, as Albert said, but that will also come eventually. Wow. Um you know that we are all about uh, uh, skills and skills that matter. What is how difficult it is to enter in the industry and what is required on uh, what, what would be your suggestion to somebody who wants to engage with the, um, as we said, uh, STEM is the first, the initial step, right? What's then? What's after that? You know, I think that the application itself is going to determine what the requirements are. If we're looking in healthcare or in a uh, fintech world, you're probably going to need somebody that has a skill set that can align with that industry and then show the acumen to actually advance the capabilities by understanding quantum physics and quantum computing at a more than rudimentary level. So I would say advanced degrees are, are helpful and having the uh, desire to build the infrastructure to support the organizational needs, to showcase the business, the actual value that you can achieve with new technology and how it would benefit the business, making it more efficient and better cost effective. If you do that, I'd say you've got your foot in the door already. Good. Well, that's a nice uh, description. Tell me, uh, do you see a future where companies uh, will uh, build uh, some kind of uh, department, internal department with their own skills that manage whatever is related to the quantum thing? Or do you see third party providers that will basically be the third uh, the intermediaries between a quantum and the users and benefit or organizations that will benefit of quantum? Well, the answer is yes to both. 
Both. Uh, yes. So, you know, Agreed. so there are a lot of quantum companies. <laughs> well, of course, uh, Chris, <laughs> I should not ask you. <laughs> no, it's, it's, but it's interesting, right? You see, you, you, you not only see a lot of quantum companies popping up, both working, you know, very close to the tech, but also very close to customers. A lot of quantum software companies whose main business model is actually, you know, talking to customers and figuring out quantum solutions for their problems as a third party. But, you know, we are saying also talking to a lot of big companies that they already have quantum teams in house from one person in certain companies to, you know, 10 people, a whole quantum group uh, already working on, on, you know, internal applications and seeing how quantum can improve. Um, so there's power in teams, isn't there? Sorry? I mean, there's power in teams. Having yeah. multiple people to support the organization gives you a, a bigger brain trust to be able to solve those problems that they're looking to facilitate with quantum computing. Absolutely. It's, and you see it's already, a bigger than one person job. Absolutely. And you see that these companies that have invested in teams, like they're producing super interesting results, state of the art stuff. Yeah. But in terms of privacy, where are we? So wherever there is an intermediation, it's generally there is a problem of privacy. What do you mean more, by privacy? Sorry. More yeah, data shared with a third party, more data shared with the third parties, of course, uh, more risks. We have that now. Yeah, yeah, of course. Well, but we are hoping to do better, right? <laughs> well, generally speaking. <laughs> Well, really. I don't know that quantum computing will solve that. No. It'll solve other problems. No, I think it um, is not a problem of quantum. It's a problem of uh, how we um, design a system in a way that facilitate the, so decrease uh, the distance between uh, the user or the, the yes, the, the person or the entity that is benefiting of something and uh, the producer, the creator of that. Yeah, I mean, you know, the thing is with any any system, any technology, any safe security system, the, the weakest link is always the human. <laughs> and that like we don't, we can't is. engineer. <laughs> no, we can't, we can't modify the human yet. Yeah, so it's a very, very much a matter of uh, culture. But yes, if, uh, if quantum could help uh, in uh, adding uh, security to systems, uh, possibly it would probably solve also the problem of uh, bad behaviors in the, in the net. How do you see quantum uh, adding value to socials, for example, if you see it? Social networks, do you see a benefit a there? I haven't really thought about that at all. No, it's a but good question. Let's try, yeah. let's try to make an exercise. Um, how, how would uh, um, social networks benefit of quantum, if any? Well, there's, there, there is a secure connection that Albert has been speaking about, like connecting to the, you know, the cloud that hosts the social network as a user. That's definitely you know, where quantum can provide an advantage. Uh, what we've been talking about, you know, uh, unique identifiers, that's where quantum can also provide, you know, physically uh, guaranteed uh, solutions. Um, and that's kind also, of like a hub and spoke. I mean, that's one-on-one, -on -one, right? You could get securely to the resource, but the whole concept with social media and social connections is that we're sharing the data. Yeah. And that's, that's, a different problem altogether that I don't believe quantum computing can really fix. That it needs to be fixed at the social media um, content provider. However, could it protect the context, the frame? Because yes, we use the socials to, um, to share within a context. But uh, what about taking out from there the information and use it for purposes that are not those of the platform itself. Like the dark web. Yeah, for example, <laughs> right. I still don't think quantum computing will stop that uh -huh. um, because people will want to find out about Billy or Susie and get more information about them because they're friends, you know, they talk. 
-hmm. and they share pictures and they share, you know, birthdays and they share successes and failures. That's not something that quantum can fix. That's more about what can the social platform understand about um, communications and delivery of information back and forth and how granular do we need to be in the protection of data for information security. That's a cybersecurity matter. I don't believe that that is a quantum computing matter. Chris? I absolutely agree. Okay, let's change uh, technology, another exercise. Uh, virtual reality and augmented reality. Can uh, quantum computing in some way interrelate with these uh, technologies and eventually add value? I think it's, a, you know, with quantum computing, anything that, you know, uh, requires huge computational power and VR does, um, my, has a strong, uh, you know, potential of benefiting from, from, from quantum computing. So doing an exercise, which could be the adoption, the, the, the use case for virtual reality and quantum together? You know, in virtual reality, as I said, there's a lot of computational resources required, right? Like you need to basically simulate a whole world around you. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is a lot of, you know, yeah. boils down to a lot of zeros and ones being flipped. It um, sounds like uh, the Avatar series where you're actually, you know, gone into a virtual reality and your avatar goes out and conquers with the, or communicates with the world. That, that, that's an application for artificial intelligence, which I think applies directly with um, quantum computing. Resources and speed of processing and things of that nature will all benefit there. Absolutely. This, but is that uh, where we want to live in a virtual reality? I was listening to a conversation this morning uh, talking about the metaverse and saying it will never happen because it's in terms of computational effort it is so huge that giving a mm -hmm. private experience to every individual uh, with their phone, it would the effort in, uh, it would be absolutely uh, huge. Could uh, um, quantum computing make it uh, so fast that reduces the consumption and make basically the metaverse more sustainable? Yeah, I mean, pos yeah, it, it, it definitely quantum computing has the potential to make it possible. Those compute that's that's with any problem that is currently hitting its limit on on whether it's possible just with classical resources. Like quantum computing offers potential for um, for for solving these types of problems, for doing these calculations, and enabling those applications. It's uh, that could be an interesting thing to explore. Very good. So, um, you personally, what would you like to work on in the next uh, in the next five years? Well, in the space of uh, quantum. Possibly. You personally, who are you talking to? <laughs> to both. <laughs> I'm you know, already I'm, in it. Who goes first? <laughs> I'm doing yeah. what I want to do. Who goes He's first? building it. He's building it. I, I, I would like to build it. I think that this is a, an opportunity for us to develop new applications, new use, new um, possibilities. But who do you want? Computing. Do you see using uh, um, quantum computing? I'd rather Ooh. not say right now. <laughs> I don't want the name. I just want the, the kind of the, the entity, the kind of profile or, or, or the It'll use case. It'll be large, large and or global organizations, could be no. pharmaceuticals, could be financial. You're talking about your customers. Government. I think you're talking about your clients. <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm not. Because <laughs> I don't think that they're my clients yet, but certainly they need to be. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Chris, uh, tell me something exciting you want to work on in the next five years. Oh, what we're working on right now, building these systems, delivering them to customers and, you know, building an actual universal machine that is, you know, er corrected for errors and actually is able to perform useful computations. You know, we're all kind of doing these solving toy problems, but what I really want to do is solve an actual, like, big business problem all right mm. so you are you saying that you miss uh, real uh, business problems no 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 i mean you know solve problems that can be solved differently 
All you right. know, solve a problem that like yeah. is not solvable right now. Everything that we solve with quantum computers right now, like, you know, you can connect to IBM Summit if you have access and solve it on the world's power, most powerful computer and it will be solved. But uh, I want to see our systems solve problems that cannot be solved. That's, uh, that's what I'm looking forward to. And tell me, are companies are coming and with problems that can eventually be the right use case that you are looking for, um, do, do the, the, is there the sufficient understanding of uh, quantum computing that make it possible that a company comes to you and says, okay, let's work on this because maybe you can help. I think a cult, the cultural yeah. aspect is, um, is a huge problem. Uh, and if I see, if I look at many technologies, the huge problem is let organizations or stakeholders understand that there is a different perspective and they could use, for example, quantum computing for, you, for solving a, a specific problem. Where do you think the cultural as, aspect is there? I don't know if you, if you are exposed to clients and to customers, to, um, to companies uh, um, absolutely. For, for answering and this company. Who yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And you know, like the companies that struggle with computational resources, they have been looking into quantum computing. You can be right. sure of it. Um, All right. So there is the feeling and the understanding of that uh, that could be the solution. Absolutely. 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 The people who are doing the calculations, they know that they need, they, they'll need quantum computing. Their managers a- might not know. They might not <laughs> believe in it. The people who are actually there in the ground trying to solve hard problems are, are looking into quantum computers to help them. It's a race. It's a race to adopt and embrace new technology. The first to um, engage wins. Okay. Absolutely. Let's look at uh, the emerging technologies right now. Can you name the first of five, those that are the most powerful or will be the most powerful in the next uh, five to 10 years? Quantum computing. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, you took the words out of my mouth, Chris. (laughs) Come on, guys. I want five at least. And I want them in order from the- the, Of course you do. The highest potential to the lower. Uh, come on. I mean, what are the biggest problems we need to solve? Climate change. So climate tech is definitely in the up fi- top five. Clean energy, space, uh, AI. Have I already listed five? <laughs> I think you're there. Just stay need- away from Skynet. <laughs> you need another two. <laughs> I think her math is, is the quantum math. Two and two is equal eight. What's that? And, and every number in between. <laughs> well, remember, oh, it's well, not a binary calculation anymore. Well, you, you, you are talking too difficult, Albert. To try okay. to translate. <laughs> Quantum computing doesn't use classical um, number schemes like on or off. Mm-hmm. It could have multiple states at the same mm-hmm. time. And okay. you actually have to look at the data using a different model, which mm-hmm. is more in a sphere, looking at angles and um, spins that present on the photons themselves. Okay. Great. So, guys, we have uh, five minutes. Uh, what, what would you like uh, to tell to the audience uh, and to those who will be listening in the future? Look to quantum computing on your next investment. <laughs> oh well, <wow. laughs> it's a true investment uh, uh, pitch, Chris. Absolutely, you've uh, you know to the audience, you you've taken the first step by listening to this, and I hope that you know you take the next steps and in, in looking into that. There's so much material online already uh, available. A lot of companies, including ours, have been very nice in 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 sharing the knowledge. Uh, for people to to adopt this technology. So look into that. Very good. Other resources that you can suggest, please, guys, if you if you have uh, books or um, any... I think that books are going to be too late. By the time it's printed in the book, the technology has already evolved and adapted and changed. 
So it's going to be all online and perhaps in white papers and shorter uh, publications that are newer. You look for the publishing date because something that's five years ago is completely outdated, even in Moore's Law, where technology evolves every two years and, and expands. You know, something that's more fresh, more current, like a year old, is going to be technologically different. Fantastic. Yeah, absolutely true. Uh, is we live in a, in a real time uh, um, context. So thank you very much, uh, Chris and Albert. Uh, thank you very much to those who are listening. Um, Ticket Talks uh, comes back next week. And uh, yeah, with another exciting technology. And uh, uh, wish you the best, uh, Chris, uh, for, for your next uh, challenges and, of course, uh, Albert, uh, for your fantastic book. Thank you very much oh, to you. everyone. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you very much.